Arthas and Diego are two of the most iconic characters in their respective universes. And that's probably just because we're human. And there's one thing people love more than a hero. is to see a hero fail, fall, die trying. Both of these once blonde, special sword wielding, undead controlling, world ending characters were once heroes of their respective kingdoms. Arthas, a prince of Lordaeron. Diego, a prince of Camavor. Both had blonde hair, which after some dark events became undead and turned white. And both fall to darkness in pursuit of a goal that's not really evil, but the lines of connection really end there. With the Riot MMO, Riot Games wants to bring the world of Runeterra to life. And big characters like Vigo will play a significant role in the story, just like the Jailer, I, I mean Arthas, played in Azeroth in World of Warcraft. Now I assume many people who watch my videos are League of Legends, Teamfight Tactics, and Legends of Runeterra fans meaning many of you may not know who Arthas Menethil is, and why I call Viego the Lich King of Runeterra. So first we'll go over Viego, then I'll cover Arthas so you can understand both their similarities and their differences. So before we get to the Lich King, let's cover the Rune King. To find where Viego is from, we need to go to the east. Not the east on the map of Runeterra. Farther. There we go. So far east, it's not even on the official map of Runeterra by Riot. Few know of this kingdom to the east, whose name lies all but forgotten among the ruins that dot its shores. Fewer still know of its foolish young ruler, whose love-struck heart was doomed to destroy it. Now a grave threat to all. That man's name was, and is, Viego. Viego Centirio Molak Volkal Haigari, and yes, it took multiple takes to get that name right, was the second son of the dynastic king of Camavor, and was never intended to lead. Instead, he lived a life of comfort that made him complacent and selfish. His mother died giving birth to him, and as the second son, his father paid him little mind since he was never destined to rule. Yet when his older brother died unexpectedly, Viego, who possessed neither the inclination nor the aptitude for rulership, suddenly found himself next in line for the throne. Before his brother's death, he had a daughter named Callista, making Viego Callista's uncle, but she was more like an older sister to him. They had been raised together, and he had always looked up to her. He was never meant to be the next king. That should have been Callista's father, the firstborn. But his unexpected death placed Viego, his younger brother, next in line. Not long after, his father, the current king, laying on his deathbed, called Callista to him. He told her that Viego does not have the temperament to rule, and he blames himself, but asks her to promise that she will guide him, counsel him, and control Viego if necessary in order to protect Camavor. That this is now her duty, and Callista does promise her grandfather. With Viego's father and older brother now dead, Viego must step into his role as king of Camavor. But to become king of Camavor, there is a ceremony that every prospective king must undergo. It is where the future king must take up the king's blade. Its name is Sanctity, an immense sword which exists only in the spiritual halls of the ancestors except when called forth by the rightful rulers of Camavor, or when summoned by the priests for the judgment of a new sovereign. The Halls of the Ancestors is basically the afterlife for Camavorians, according to the people of Camavor. This is somewhere in the spirit realm of Runeterra, we don't know too much about it beyond that. The spirit realm itself is a parallel pocket of existence to the physical realm, both of which make up the realm of existence of Runeterra. Every monarch of Camavor wore the Argent Crown, which is a belligerent tri-spike circlet perfectly befitting the long line of belligerent rulers. But sanctity was the true symbol of the throne. The primacy of whoever held sanctity was undisputed, and to possess the blade of the king was to be soul bound to it. Although not every heir to the Camavorian throne survived the ritual of binding, dozens of heirs had perished in the sanctum of judgment to sanctity. This is why some called the blade soul render and was feared by Camavorian heroes and enemies alike. You would think with this knowledge the previous king, Viego's father, would have paid more attention to Viego, his second son, as the first may have had just had his soul consumed by sanctity in the end. But Viego's mother died giving birth to him, so maybe that had something to do with his father and some resentment which is why he didn't pay Viego much mind. Anyways, I'm going to read a bit from the book Ruination here just because I want to do it justice. Viego waited expectantly for the ritual to begin, looking up at Callista by his side. Tell me again of my father's last words, whispered Viego. Callista stifened. He said you'd be a great king, Callista lied. That you'd eclipse even his great deeds. Viego nodded, 
trying to take comfort in her words. Then the blade of the king appeared, and Callista's breath caught in her throat as she looked upon it. You'll be with me, won't you? He whispered urgently. I don't think I can do this alone. Rule, I mean. I'll be with you, said Callista. I'll stand with you as I always have. I promise. This was a boy thrust into a position of rulership he was not prepared for due to a lack of a mother and a negligent father. But still, Diego gave her a nod and turned back to sanctity, hanging motionless in the shaft of light. In seconds, the moment would be lost. The time of judgment was now. The priest chanting reached a fevered pitch. Smoke coiled around the sacred blade like many serpents, writhing and twisting. Without further pause, Diego stepped forward and grasped the sword, closing both hands around its hilt. His eyes widened and his pupils contracted sharply. Then he opened his mouth and began to scream. Moving past this moment, Diego survives the ceremony and does indeed become the King of Camavor, able to summon sanctity from the spirit realm at his whim. Still, he showed little interest in his position until he met a poor seamstress, Isolde. So taken was he by her beauty that the young king offered her his hand in marriage, and thus one of the most powerful rulers of the age was wed to a peasant girl. Their romance was enchanting, and Viego, who'd rarely shown interest in anyone other than himself, devoted his life to her. The two were inseparable. He scarcely went anywhere without his old, always lavishing gifts upon his queen, and his attention could seldom be broken when she was present. Here is an excerpt from Queen Isolde's journal during this time. Viego's love and his willingness to listen give me such hope. He is imperfect, aren't we all? But he wants to be better. More importantly, he wants Kimavor to be better. He gets so impassioned when we speak late into the night of all the improvements we will enact. With him at my side, and with Callista guarding our backs, I know we will succeed, despite the misgivings and machinations of the court. She goes on to say that, The courtiers and aristocrats despise me for my humble bloodline and foreign bearing and ignore me whenever not required to do otherwise. This excerpt shows Viego's love for Isolde and for Camavor. It also shows how the court saw Isolde, a foreigner with no right to rule. Viego's allies fume. With a queen of a noble background, some plotted in secret to end their new king's reign before it had begun. His nation's enemies, meanwhile, saw an opportunity to strike, and the vipers began to circle. They hated that Isolde was lowborn, they hated that she was foreign. Thus did an assassin's poison dagger one day come for Viego. But the king was well defended. Callista deflected the poison blade at the last second, and the dagger did not strike true, instead grazing Isolde. The toxin worked quickly, and Isolde fell into a ruinous torpor. While Viego could only watch in horror as his wife's condition grew ever more serious, overwhelmed with fury and despair. He spent every last coin within his coffers trying to save her. Now not really relevant to Viego, but I loved this line from Isolde's journal while she was on her deathbed. Perhaps I am merely delusional with fever, but I swear I've heard the impatient paddling of the wolf circling my bed as I drift in and out of slumber. And once, I'm sure of it, I saw a pale luminous form crouched on my windowsill. The lamb and the wolf's headed mask obscuring her ovine face. If you guys want a video on the lamb and the wolf, let me know. They are really the death gods of Runeterra, and together are known as kindred. They come to someone when they are near death. You can choose one of them to either fight the wolf or to go peacefully with the lamb. It seems everyone on Runeterra gets to make that choice when it comes time for them to die. That is what's happening in the Still Here cinematic, by the way. Trindamir sees the lamb, but instead of going peacefully, he chooses to fight the wolf. But they are not really there, if that makes sense. He's actually fighting the people around him. But the lamb and the wolf are representative of death, although I think they are very real within the world of Runeterra. But there's a lot to Trindamir and a reason he can't die, which is a story for another time. And that is why the lamb looks at him confused since he should have died by then. At least that's what I think, just something cool. Okay, kindred rant over. While searching for a cure, he eventually came across some parchment revealing the secret of the Blessed Isles, of its waters that healed any ailment. He sent his niece, Callista, to find the Blessed Isles. 
Now, if you want to learn more about Callista finding the Blessed Isles, I recommend the Callista's Odyssey event in Wild Rift. But if you just want to focus on Viego, feel free to skip to the next timestamp. Callista follows the map to a place closer to the Serpentine Delta than to Camivore. There she finds a white mist that rose up hundreds of feet. Every attempt to pierce the mist resulted in their ship being turned around, somehow ending up back where they started. She then sails to the Serpent Isles, which is near the mist-shrouded waters, and where she hopes to find a guide. She eventually comes in contact with Soraka. All you need to know about her is that she is an Aspect, powerful, god-level beings of Targon. She gave up her immortal form to protect the mortal races from their own ignorance and violent instincts. Though the powerful magic coursing through her veins burned this new body from the inside out, she knew her suffering meant little if she could help to heal all that was broken and incomplete. Callista comes in contact with Soraka, who tells her that the Golden Maiden of the Sea will take her to the Blessed Isles, but not before warning her of the darkness she would find there should she continue down this path and telling her that, that should she turn back to Camivore, she would live a long, peaceful life with the man she loves, Ledros. Callista chooses the darker path, which Soraka already knew she would choose, as she can see the future. Callista heads back out to sea and sees a ship under attack. She helps them, and on the bow of the attack ship happens to be a golden maiden. She meets two men, Seeker Adept Tyrus and his apprentice, Rise. Initially, they don't want to tell Callista about the Blessed Isles, but after Callista tells him of the Queen, Tyrus, believing her heart is in the right place, agrees to guide them there. He leads Callista to the Blessed Isles, where she meets the Council of Helia. Callista. Love and happiness could be yours. But are you willing to give up on your promise and leave your home? You would be a wise and just ruler. But how long would your reign be? Honor the promise you have made. But anticipate that darkness might ensue. She informs them of the Queen and pleads for their help, but after days of deliberation, the Council refuses. As Callista is leaving, she is stopped by a man named Erlok Grail, the Warden Prefect of Thresholds. He informs her that the Council lied to her. He gives her a vial of the Blessed Waters, which is not enough to save the Queen, but is enough to confirm what he's saying to be true, as well as a waystone which can be used to make it back through the mist to the Blessed Isles. He tells her to bring the king and the dying queen here, as the council will not be able to refuse them when they are on their doorstep. In return, he would like a position and title within the court of Camivore. More on Erlok Grail later. While Callista was on her journey, a soul perished in her bed, and Viego was consumed by madness. But Viego would not accept this reality. His search for an antidote became desperate, crazed. Every treasure of the kingdom, every scrap of wealth, was sacrificed on his quest to return her to him, and as the land fell into disarray, Viego hid himself away with his soul's body, becoming hateful and violent. Callista eventually returns to the city to find it rioting after granaries were shut. She went to Viego and informed him that she had found the Blessed Isles. Viego, still consumed with madness, believing the queen yet lived, brought Callista to his soul so his soul could hear the good news. This is when Callista discovers that the queen had already passed, and she was too late. Callista then refuses to tell Viego how to get through the mist to the Blessed Isles, believing no good can come of it, and in response, he throws her in jail. This is where Hecarim comes into play. Hecarim can be summed up as a man hungry for power at any cost. He is the commander of the Iron Order, which is a brotherhood sworn to defend their king's land. Although he allegedly attained the position of commander, through a gruesome betrayal. When the queen died, Hecarim chose to sour the king's grief into hatred, seeking sanction to lead the Iron Order into foreign lands. 
he would avenge her death while earning yet more dark renown for himself. He goes to Callista's cell and convinces her to tell Viego how to get to the Blessed Isles, saying that perhaps if Viego goes there and sees for himself that nothing can be done for the queen, maybe it will snap him out of this madness and save Camivor. In reality, he wanted to plunder the Blessed Isles for their wealth. Callista eventually agrees and tells Viego how to get to the Blessed Isles, saying she will guide him there, but the Iron Order must remain behind. It seems Callista, at least to some extent, was aware that Hecarim was not all he seemed. Viego then turns to Callista and agrees. After a long voyage, Callista opened the mist with the Waystone and they arrive on the Blessed Isles. Viego begs the Council of Helia to save his queen, telling them that if they save her, he will leave and Camivor will be forever in their debt. Initially they refuse, but Viego does something no king has ever done, gets on one knee and begs them to save his soul. However, once a Helia physician looks over his soul, they realize she has already passed and that there is nothing that can be done. All that is left is to mourn. Viego initially accepts this and makes preparations to depart Helia, returning to Camivor to mourn the loss of a soul. Until Warden Prefect Erlok Grail comes into the picture. He yells up to the king aboard his ship that the governing council of the Blessed Isles lied to him, that the waters of life exist, that the Well of Ages lies beneath a distant tower, and that it would bring his soul back to him. Erlok Grail is pretty similar to Hecarim in that his only goal is power. He feels slighted by the Council of Helia that they have not placed him in a position of power as he believed he deserved. He sees the King of Camivore as his only chance to punish the Council of Helia and climb to power as he believes he deserves. Diego, hearing this, loses it, picks up his soul and begins moving towards the tower. The Council of Helia stops him, saying they will not let him pass and that the power of the Well of Ages is not to be trifled with, that he has no notion of the consequences of what he attempts. Erlok Grail again whispers in his ear that they lie. In response, he tells Callista and the few soldiers with him to kill anyone in his path. Callista refuses, enraging Viego. He begins stalking towards the masters, sanctity materializing in his hand, stating that he will do it himself. Callista begged Viego to turn back from this madness and says she will not let him harm the innocent people of Helia. Viego, refusing to back down, turns to Nuno, someone loyal to him, and gives the order to commence. Nuno raises the waystone, parts the mist, and the entire fleet of the Iron Order emerges. With his great army, he stormed the peaceful country by force, slaughtering everyone who stood in his way until he at last breached the Well of Ages, and within its inner sanctum, he does indeed find the waters of life. Viego cut down the guards and let his wife drift beneath the blessed waters. She would return to him, no matter the destruction he wrought, no matter the cost. And for just one moment, she did.
Isolde rose a horrifying wraith of shadow and rage, and in her pain, her anger, her confusion at being ripped from death, she took Viego's own enchanted blade and thrust it through his heart. The magic of the waters in the ancient sword clashed, and the chamber's energy erupted, tearing across the aisles and trapping everything it touched in tortured, conscious undeath. Just moments prior, outside the tower, the Iron Order under Hecarim and the Honor Guard under Callista were battling. While Callista and the Honor Guard were able to hold back the Iron Order, they would not be able to stop them indefinitely. She knew Viego had made it to the tower and needed to be stopped. With Hecarim at the tip of her spear, and knowing that they cannot truly defeat the Iron Order, she made a deal. The Iron Order lets the Honor Guard through to stop Viego, and in return, she will let Hecarim live. Hecarim agrees. on, the Blessed Isles are now referred to as the Shadow Isles. The unprecedented magical cataclysm left the barrier between the material and the spirit realms in tatters, effectively merging the two and dooming all living things in an instant. Now, a malevolent black mist permanently shrouds the Isles, and the earth itself is tainted by dark sorcery. Mortals who dare to venture to these dismal shores will slowly have their life force stolen away from them which in turn attracts the insatiable, restless spirits of the dead. Those who perish within the mist are condemned to haunt this nightmarish place for eternity. Worse still, the power of the Shadow Isles appears to wax stronger with every passing year, allowing the most powerful specters to roam farther and farther across Runeterra. <laughs> Emphasis on roam farther, for all spirits trapped in the Shadow Isles cannot spread beyond the Black Mist, for now. Yet of this, Viego remembers nothing. His country collapsed into ruin, great nations rose and fell, and in time even his name was forgotten. Until a thousand years after his death, we see the events of the Ruined King take place. Erlok Grail, now known as Thresh, is sadistic and cunning, and an ambitious and restless spirit of the Shadow Isles, now sustaining himself by tormenting and breaking others with slow, excruciating inventiveness. His victims suffer far beyond their brief mortal coil, as Thresh wreaks agony upon their souls, imprisoning them in his unholy lantern to torture for all eternity. Thresh manipulates a pirate by the name of Gangplank to work with him to bring Viego back, with Thresh's real goal being to move past the black mist of the Shadow Isles and reap all the souls of the world, as the more souls he reaps, the more powerful he becomes. Viego stood once more and this time he would not fall. His mind twisted by the same dangerous obsession he possessed in life. Viego's unflinching, deranged love fuels his every action, his every desire, his every atrocity. The deadly black mist pours freely from Viego's broken heart, ripping the life from everything it touches, and he uses the mist to scour the world for some way to return a soul to his side. Legions will fall before him, only to rise again in his service. Continents will be swallowed by living darkness, and the world will pay for every moment of happiness it stole from an ancient ruler, laid low by an all-consuming love. He cares not for the destruction he causes, so long as he can see a soul's face again. His reign is terror, his love is eternal, and until his soul returns to him, all will fall before the ruined king. So now you know who Viego is, let's get to Arthas. But this is a Runeterra channel, not an Azeroth channel, so I don't want to make this a whole thing, otherwise this video will probably be like an hour long. 
I really think the official lore short from World of Warcraft does a great job. If you've already seen it or know the story of Arthas, feel free to skip to the next timestamp. It's like three minutes. Here it is, Arthas Menethil. Arthas Menethil, son of King Tyrannus Menethil II, the ruler of Lordaeron. As a promising young paladin, Arthas was trained in combat by Muradin Bronzebeard and learned the ways of the light under Uther the Lightbringer. Soon after his induction into the Knights of the Silver Hand, a plague gripped the Northlands of Lordaeron. I joined Arthas to help investigate an insidious disease that caused the dead to rise again. After fighting the infected undead, we encountered the necromancer Kel'Thuzad and discovered his plans to infect outlying villages under the orders of the dreadlord Mal'Ganis. We set out to stop the demon before he could reach his next target, the city of Stratholm. But we arrived too late. The citizens had already consumed poisoned grain that would doom them to rise into undeath. To stop the plague from spreading further, Arthas ordered his knights to purge the entire city. Uther and I were horrified and refused to obey his cruel command. Those who remained loyal to Arthas joined him and began the culling of Stratholm. Arthas sought vengeance upon Mal'Ganis, but the demon slipped away to the frozen land of Northrend. While leading his forces in pursuit of Mal'Ganis, Arthas came upon his former mentor, Muradin, searching for a powerful blade called Frostmorn. When the sword was found, Muradin read its inscription and warned the prince that the weapon was cursed. But Arthas believed that the blade would give him the power to save his people. When the weapon broke free, a shard of ice struck Muradin down. Heeding the call of Frostmorn, Arthas claimed the sword and left Muradin for dead. With Frostmorn in hand, Arthas confronted Mal'Ganis, who told him the voice he was now hearing was that of the Lich King, Ner'zhul. Obeying his new master, Arthas slew the Dreadlord and abandoned his troops as he pushed deeper into the frozen north. When Arthas returned to Lordaeron, the kingdom rejoiced at the homecoming of its beloved prince. But that joy turned to ashes when Arthas entered the throne room and ran the accursed blade through his father's heart. Arthas scourged the land in the name of the Lich King, Ner'zhul. To reach the throne of his master, Arthas had to face Illidan's storm rage. After a grueling battle, the victorious Arthas ascended to the frozen throne. He drove his blade through the ice releasing the spirit of Ner'zhul from its icy prison. The two beings merged into one and became the true Lich King. Should he rise again from the frozen north, all of Azeroth will face his wrath. So now you have a pretty good understanding of both the Ruined King, Viego, and the Lich King, Arthas. One thing I do want to point out in that last cinematic from Arthas is that his whole goal was to save the people of Lordaeron. That was his goal. His end goal was to save the people of Lordaeron. Even when he was killing everyone in Strathholm, that was to save the people of Lordaeron, the few for the many. Uh, I just wanted to make sure I point that out before I get into everything else. But yeah, the things they have in common, right? Very superficial. Blonde hair. Both were princes, both fall to darkness on the path to something that's not actually evil, and end up controlling the undead. Really after that, the similarities stop. One thing I do want to say is why these characters are so compelling, and then I want to explain to you why Viego is at risk of being kind of ruined in my opinion. So both of these characters are compelling, I think because they're relatable. You ever heard that analogy where you have a train and there's two tracks, one track has a ton of people on it, the other track has one person on it. And 
The choice might seem obvious, oh you choose the track with the one person on it. Arthas does kind of make that choice, because if he lets Strath- in Arthas's mind, if he lets Stratholme die, he can end the plague there. And by ending the plague in Stratholme, sure he has to kill everyone in Stratholme. One, they're already infected in his mind, they're going to be turned into undead. If he sacrifices himself in a way, by killing his own people in Stratholme before they can even become Scourge, he can stop the plague and save the rest of Lordaeron. So he's choosing the one for the many, like the few for the many. What does he do after that? Okay, now Malganis flees off to Northrend. You expect Arthas just to stay back after this guy literally almost annihilated his entire kingdom, turned almost everyone into Scourge? He has to follow him to Northrend because he doesn't want this to happen again. And he's already shown that he's willing to sacrifice himself to save, the, to save his people. And he, he has a voice on, he says, I would gladly bear any curse to save my homeland. Now, I call out to the spirits of this place. I will give anything or pay any price. If only you will help me save my people. That's why he takes up Frostmourne. The road to get Arthas to a dark place is paved with very, very good intentions. And that's super relatable to us. I mean, you don't, you never want to be in a position that Arthas is in, but it's relatable. Like you can, you can put yourself in his shoes and see like, would you end up that same way? Would you choose something different? Would I chase him to Northrend? Would I pick up Frostmourne? Would I sacrifice Strathmore? Because Arthas actually isn't a bad guy, but then you can see how his choices got him to a bad place where he became the Lich King. Now, when it comes to Viego, I can see him also being a very relatable character. You can put yourself in his shoes of this young boy who was neglected by his father now thrust into a position of leadership that he wasn't trained for or ready for. His father then passes shortly after and he's forced to become the leader of Camivore. And he has like Callista by his side who supports him but then he also finds a soul. And then there's an assassination attempt on him and it goes wrong and ends up hitting a soul and poisoning her and while she's on her deathbed, he's willing to sacrifice everything, even the kingdom of Camivore, to save her. And if you can put yourself in his shoes like a soul is dying, do you A, accept her death and just say, you know, I have to focus on the kingdom of Camivore, I'm the king? Or do you sacrifice every penny you have, comb through the library searching for any, any possibility of a cure, paying physicians obscene amounts, finally discovering the blessed isles, and doing whatever it takes to get to these blessed waters to save it? Like these are, these are things that you can, you can relate to. You never want to be in, put in a position of like Arthas or Viego, but you can put yourself in their shoes. And I think that's why these characters are relatable is because while each individual decision is not necessarily bad, you can see how it leads them to a bad place and a dark place. And that's why I think they're so compelling. But Viego, I do feel like has a chance to be ruined. Uh, and the reason I'm saying this is because you have book the book Ruination, the Rune King, and the Sentinels of Light event, which all also show that Viego really didn't treat Isolde very well towards the end. Isolde saying things like, he refuses to accept her death and he'll react poorly when he's denied what he wants, gets upset with her when, her when she says things that don't align with his vision of her. It becomes almost like he immortalized her in a way and when she doesn't reach that immortalization, he, he's upset with her. And by doing this, when you make him a spoiled brat forever, then it becomes like it's a child who just lost their plaything. And that's not really relatable. Like, who's going to relate to a spoiled brat who his wife died, he never really cared for, and just saw her as a prize that he coveted, got pissed, and then sacrificed his whole kingdom to sail to the Blessed Isles and didn't care about anyone and just single-mindedly set his goal to resurrect her. Like, it's not a relatable story anymore. It's relatable if you keep a soul in Viego's love, like a true, he really cared about her, and with the guilt of an assassination attempt that targeted him but hitting her and he wanted to save her. That's relatable. And that's I think that's what makes Viego a character as compelling and as strong of a character as Arthas. If you take away the relationship between Viego and Isolde and make it where it was pretty dark and Viego didn't treat her well, now it's just Viego's a villain. And you need those characters, don't get me wrong, like those straight up characters that are just kind of bad always and you have characters like Thresh who are in that way who's just seeking power, Hecarim, you have those characters already in, in World of Warcraft you have Helthuzad. These are characters that are straight up bad and they're obviously bad. 
but you'll never see people as never see a, as large of a fan base for these characters as you as you do for the gray characters like Arthas and Viego. And I hope that Viego stays gray. I know Riot Games is deciding really what's canon and what isn't right now. And I think you need to make, I really feel that you need to make Viego's backstory with his old, the stuff that makes him treat her badly and make their love look a little bit more obsessive and like spoiled and weird. If you ruin that, that like innocent, the, the love between Isolde and Viego, you make him no longer a relatable character and pretty much just another big bad, just like anyone else. And you already have that with certain characters. You don't need, you don't want Viego to be another character like that. Viego is supposed to be like a relatable, compelling villain. And, th and this isn't something new. Look at Darth Vader, right? If you take Darth Vader and you take Padme away and make it where he just doesn't even really care about Padme and just saw her as a prize that he coveted and once he had her, didn't care anymore and just wanted her to behave a certain way and the relationship is toxic darth vader is no longer a relatable character that's gray and darth vader actually is very gray I mean, you can put yourself into anakin skywalker's shoes but you do have characters that are completely power hungry and evil and that's palpatine but if you make darth vader into a palpatine he's not going to be as popular as he is you want a dark character whose road to the dark place is paved with good intentions and Anakin's was. For Anakin it was Padme and his whole goal was saving Padme and honestly there's a lot of similarities between Viego and Darth Vader. Which is why I see so much potential in Viego and I want Viego to be the character that he could be especially with the Ride and Roll coming out. I feel like Viego could be one of those great characters like Arthas level or Darth Vader level because people can relate to that. where. You may want to do the right thing, but sometimes you have to do a bad thing to get there. And how bad is too bad? When does it become where you're no longer on that original mission? But with this one tweak in his past, making the relationship with him and his soul more one-sided and toxic and him being a spoiled brat ruins him, in my opinion. But I hope you enjoyed this episode. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. What do you think of Viego and his old story, their backstory? Should it be changed the way I'm suggesting it? I hope you will now understand why I call Viego the Lich King of Runeterra. At least I feel he has the potential to be, uh, in my opinion. But let me know your thoughts. So if you're completely new to Runeterra lore, one, I'm, uh, I'm amazed that you found my video. I'm a small Runeterra lore channel, but there's a link in the top left corner of your screen right now that goes to Ride a Mo lore video from beginning to present day. That would be a great jumping off point to the other videos. If you already know Runeterra lore, probably click to the bottom left and that covers the greatest warrior in Runeterra. If you can give the video a like and subscribe, it helps me out a lot. If you're looking for more Ride on Mo content and news updates, we have the Brazen Hydra podcast, as well as Eclipse channel where you get short form content from the podcast. We're talking about the Ride on Mo and all things Runeterra. Thanks for stopping by the Grove and I will see you in the next one.